So when we talk about Jesus, some people feel very comfortable uh, Spiritual communication is a tricky thing, right? Um, and there's a kind of, at least this is how I think of it, maybe this is my own particular stumbling block, but a kind of mental interference that can come up. Um, it's usually very easy to tell um, the voice of God from one's own inner thoughts. It's usually really easy to catch when you try and like paste over or not quite hear something right or kind of twist something. And it's not always for like your benefit. Sometimes your mind kind of makes whatever they're saying like harsher than what God's actual intent is. It's mental interference, yeah. And uh, I feel like some people are more or less confident in their ability to have communication with the divine that isn't, you know, too uh, blurred, dulled, distorted, distorted, too distorted by their own experience to actually... And certainly, nobody should teach private revelation as public revelation. Um, just be upfront is the thing. Just tell people where you get your ideas. Don't try and present it as like, oh, you know, he came to me in a vision. Like, if you have a conversation with God, there's many different levels that those kinds of conversations can have. There's certainly... Um, I've never had like a physical manifestation of God. It's not like I've never had a vision. But you don't... For, for starters, I didn't learn anything. I just went, ooh. Uh, and even if I had, it wouldn't be my place to teach it, but if I did, I'd need to be specific about like what kind of experience that was, where it comes from. Um, why am I talking about this? Because for me, for whatever reason, Jesus' existence as a historical figure actually makes me more hesitant to trust my soul, my heart, my mind, my body to actually let Christ indwell and to actually fully hear whatever he needs to communicate to me. But I feel uh, weirdly comfortable in conversation with God the Father, uh, and sometimes God the Spirit. It's not like I don't have any kind of relationship with Jesus, but for sure, well, for, okay, so there's the historical reality of like not having any historical footprint of Jesus. Um, but it also to me never the the focus of Jesus' ministry. Like this idea of a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, it's a phrase that especially to American or to you know yeah to American ears would sound very, uh, you know, it just sounds like a normal part of the everyday Christian lexicon. But again, it's a very American Puritan idea. 
When you look at the structure of high church liturgies, what you see is a tendency more toward focusing on God the Father as the like person that you are addressing in prayer, uh, and Jesus acts as intermediary. It's not that there are never prayers to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, uh, even prayers, you know, referring to the various saints. I mean, usually they're just mentioned, but occasionally the saints are talked to, asked to intercede for us, usually. Uh, the Roman tradition likes to make a big deal about, like, oh, no, we're definitely not praying to the saints. I obviously care less. Uh, there's some, like, there is an important truth there, though, I should definitely make sure to say like there really is something it's not just splitting hairs but I mean it's just also it's okay that that line's blurry as long as it's defined you know this is my mind but whatever uh, but that seems to have been a lot of the point of Jesus ministry in general was to bring us into closer relationship with God the Father, through the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit to each of our neighbors as Alter Christus, as other Christs. That, that God is in every person they see uh, and that they uh, have the potential and the potential judgment of a god, of a little lower than a god, as Psalm 8 says. He doesn't, he wants to be remembered. Do this in remembrance of me, he said during the Eucharist. So we've interpreted that as in the tradition as we do at least on Sundays. Uh, a remembrance, you, almost always a uh, Eucharist celebration. Sometimes there's no priest available, uh, no ordained priest available, uh, no institutionally ordained priest available. We were all baptized into Christ, who was prophet, priest, and king. All of us. And again, that's, you know, I tend to view it much more as a responsibility than power. Because uh, I'm healing from shit. Uh, it's probably more to my detriment at this point, but fire doth burn. Uh, God plays with the safeties off. There are stakes. Uh, I mean, like, I don't know about, like, eternal damnation or whatever, but, like, there's something. Uh, if there's not, does it matter? Well, if it doesn't, it won't matter by the time we get there either, so... Coming back around now, Jesus calls us to have a relationship with him in places, but I'd argue that the, that the, the focus is on loving one another and on loving God the Father, and so whether that's due to my own makeup or if there is something that would resonate with other people about that. One way that I do bridge that gap, the tradition is very insistent about 
Jesus be uh, literally embodied in a various number of ways post-resurrection. First and foremost, as human, divine, fully incarnate God, fully human, post-resurrection Jesus, up in the heavenly sanctuary, uh, performing his mediator duties as high priest before the throne of God the Father to connect us again, uh, or through him, at least, you know, uh, certainly not going to try and claim a monopoly on connection to the divine. Uh, but one of these is where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of you. That's straight from the mouth. That's, that's probably one of the genuine sayings. Uh, to my mind, at least, what do I know? But uh, there's something about when Christians gather, especially when we gather in remembrance of Jesus, that makes Jesus present again in some way, even if there's no Eucharist specifically celebrated. But there is, of course, the Eucharist. Um, the church, uh, the word ecclesia, it literally means assembly. The, the, the church assembly uh, is also called the body of Christ, in part because, you know, multiple people gathered there, in part because the institutional hierarchs, you know, had a commitment to legitimating how this, these structures are embedded in Christ and I think that's certainly true to certain extents. I, I certainly think that Christ is in part embodied in the history of the tradition. Uh, you know, Jesus has been alive this whole time, living through his church his people and every good and bad thing that we've done since is part of the story of Jesus's body which still had its scars after the resurrection healed incorruptible immortal and still scarred I, I, I love the mysteries, you know. So, there's two or three gathered. There's the church. There's the history of the tradition itself. But to my mind, the, the crowning are the scriptures. Uh, which, for Christians, uh, is a little complicated. We've got the New Testament, uh, the Christian scriptures, the, the Gospels, uh, the letters of Paul, old Pauline school letters, letters of John, and uh, the Acts of the Apostles, which is actually like Luke part two, and the Revelations, the Apocalypse, the unveiling. Uh, that's the Christian, the, the scriptures like most proper to Christians. Uh, and then there's the Tanakh, which are properly Hebrew scriptures, uh, which Christianity has a complicated relationship with. Oh, goodness. I guess I can't really avoid going down this rabbit hole, huh? Because anti-Semitism is baked into the tradition. If I'm going to talk about scriptures, anti-Semitism is all over the New Testament. Like, it's in all four of the Gospels. It's in Paul. It's in Revelations. It's in Acts. It's... The division was bitter, especially by the time everything got written down. We have reason to believe that, you know, there was a kind of side-by-side -side tolerance you know like a, what did I say earlier like it's a boundary that existed but wasn't necessarily super solid uh, it was just known uh, but eventually 
Uh, and you know, good white leftist that I am, I tend to see, you know, oh, Christian surely must have been the aggressors in this situation. We must have just done something to really piss, to like really deserve getting thrown out of the synagogue. And you know, just because I just can see that that the narrative is culturally conditioned doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, but you know, it's probably more complicated than that. But neither have been. By the time everything got written down, anti-Semitism and supersessionism, the idea that Christianity wasn't just like an offshoot, it wasn't just like an alternative, uh, and it wasn't like their Jewish siblings could just, you know, keep hanging out in their old covenant and being fine. Uh, in their minds, their new covenant, their new testament, had superseded the old testament, the old covenant of the Jews. And again, this is baked into Christian scriptures. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews, which is because of its central focus on altar worship, I, as like a kind of vaguely trad Cathy person, I love the letter to the Hebrews. It sucks. It's horrible. Uh, it is about some of the like most anti-Semitic things in the whole tradition. Uh, and like I'm kind of gearing up for a facing of it, and it's hard. It's it's really hard, uh, and and there's a non-zero chance that I come out the other side of it not Christian anymore. I don't know what that would look like, but <sighs> so much of my theology is wrapped up in this letter. And this letter is so wrapped up in, like, condemning, like, the entire Jewish people. Like, as a culture, as a nation, I mean, you could definitely, I, I'm, it would be unfair not to note that there is a genuine focus on figures of authority, of hierarchs and, uh, you know, members of the upper classes. That's, that is also there. Um, but again, if you look at the history of the tradition and how it gets used later, like, yeah, just sin, evil. Uh, you know, like true, true, abominable evil towards the Jewish people from our tradition. But you can't just I believe in Jesus, by which I mean, I don't just mean like I choose to, I mean that like my body, when I check in, like what is reality? It says Jesus is, and how am I gonna argue with that? What am I gonna do in the face of that except, okay? But belief in Jesus is incompatible with Judaism. Uh, that's just been made clear to me over and over and over again. And there are some Christians who want to claim to be Jews. And there are some people with like legitimate claims to Jewish heritage and the Jewish tradition who also venerate Christ to various degrees. Um, not speaking to that. Uh, but like messianic. Jews are actually just Christians who are like appropriating rabbinical Judaism for their own theological ends. Like that's 
it's, it's, that's not, I don't encourage that. <laughs> uh, but I also, but here's the frustrating, it's like, Christianity is bound up in the tradition of the people of Judah. There's no, just like you can't take the anti-Semitism out of it, you can't take the Semitism out of it either. You can't, there are, the, the entire tradition is founded on the Tanakh, on the Torah, on various traditions of quotation and interpretation from uh, mostly the Septuagint text, uh, which is a translation of the Tanakh from Hebrew into Greek. Um, I don't know what the Jewish view on its origins are. The Christian story is that it was compiled by Jewish elders in Alexandria, uh, but I don't know for sure without looking it up right now whether that is like neutrally or mutually agreed upon a uh, historical fact or if that's just a Christian fable I don't know um, but it's everywhere and there is also some clear uh, awareness in the tradition in Jesus' own life of uh, the Masoretic text of the Hebrew text, or at least of the Aramaic of the Aramaic text, which would at least still be in a Semitic language, not in uh, you know Greek, which is much more distantly related. Um, so you have the New Testament, the Christian scriptures in Greek. You have the Tanakh in Hebrew which is both foundational to Christianity and the teachings of Jesus and has been turned into a cudgel against the people whose scriptures they primarily are. Um, I come to a place where, uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, there's like a parallelism in my mind. That they're still God's people. God is still their God. Uh, I'm not part of that relationship. I can't speak to any of that. Uh, but I have to have a lot of awareness of it because I'm trying to get into the mind of my spiritual teacher who is... Jewish, who was born, like, of those people, who is ethnically and religiously, I mean, that's a Western modern concept, but it's baked in. You can't just pull it out. So you've got to have a lot of familiarity with the thought of what we have of the historical record of Jews before and during the Second Temple period when Jesus lived and died. Um, and I think prudent to have an awareness of how that tradition continued on and continues on into the present in the various Jewish sects. Um, But it's not our place to say, like, oh, because we see Jesus in the scriptures, because there are what I'd say are, obviously, from my biased point of view, I'd say they're legitimate interpretations of scripture that point to Jesus. Uh, Isaiah and the Psalms, especially, like, Christians have been riffing on those for the whole time. The whole time. And, I mean, it appears that Jesus himself was a huge fan of using the Psalms and Isaiah to refer to himself. Uh, so again, this makes it very hard to like just kind of cast those scriptures aside. Uh, but to be cognizant of the fact that we're kind of interlopers there is an uncomfortable tension that I think all Christians are called to. Um, and for scholars, I think that there's 
You have to be aware of the Masoretic text, and you have to be aware of the Septuagint, because the Septuagint really did, like, because Christianity quickly did become a mostly Gentile religion, uh, it was mostly Greek-speaking, because Greek was a very popular Western Gentile language. Um, uh, and it was the, I mean, it was even popular in the East at the time, just because of the cultural predominance. And, uh, and uh, you have to be aware of these scriptures on their own terms as they existed before there were Jesus around to throw complications <laughs> around, uh, you know, there being two different traditions now of interpreting these scriptures. Uh, I don't want to try and supersede one with the other. I also don't want to try and just pretend that like, oh, okay, I can just back off of the of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew scriptures, like, unfortunately, I can't. That's, that's, that is not an option in my current understanding of the, the, what Christ was all about. Um, I don't think that we're called to be Jewish. I also don't think that we're called to be, like, fetishizing Jews, or, like, we're not called to be, like, guardians or siblings or what the fuck ever, like, any more than all humanity is called to be guardians of each other and siblings of each other, of course. Like, I'd love to see, you know, bonds of mutual sibling love between Jews and Christians and Muslims and, I mean, obviously, like, between all humanity but it, within the Abrahamic faiths, I think it's, you know, it, and it's contentious to call Christianity an Abrahamic faith and uh fair is my response to that like yeah fair but that's what you know I have no reason like it, I, I I I look at the scriptural record as it exists I look at the tradition as it exists and I churn all of that through my upbringing and what my body spits out is that the Christian way of interpreting scripture is a legitimate branch. I just lost my train. That, and that Jesus himself claimed, like it shows up in all the Gospels, multiple places, is a big part of the tradition. It seems very likely that that's because it was something that Jesus actually harped on about. And based on the like shape of his ministry, it would certainly seem to be the case. of Abraham, like literally claiming spiritual descendancy from Abraham. Uh, so again, I feel called to an awareness of like, oh, yeah, sure. There are valid reasons to criticize calling Christianity the Abrahamic faith at all. Um, we talk about monotheism. I think that there is an important message in Trinity and Unity not being as distinct as maybe the, the, the other two traditions generally tend to see it, but they, they often see us as polytheistic. I think that from their point of view, that's a very valid criticism. I do think that Christians have been a little too precious about being strict about our monotheism. But I think that that has also kind of likewise made us a little hesitant to like double down and say, but no, like we don't like to think of God and Jesus. To think of God the Father and God the Son as being 
wholly separate entities to the ex- to the extent that they represent a polytheistic pantheon uh, is I think if you can't see the way in which that would not be the case then you haven't seen the mystery that you are trying to reject uh, which let me be super clear I do that every single day reject mysteries that I haven't really fully even seen the introductory face of we all have a lot to learn from each other Um, but like at the end of the day I guess I'm, I'm getting into this because I'm trying to defend my faith um Because I'm trying to explain why I can't just throw my hands up in the air and say, yeah, it's kind of a toxic dumpster fire of anti-Semitism that quickly got seized by the Roman Empire and, you know, turned into the fucking sun cult empire. Like, it got turned into into a puppet of the devil. Uh, in many times and places, at least, uh, if not to its core. Uh, like, God says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That has only led me to have my eye and spiritual ears out for a broader definition of church. Uh rather than a firmer conviction that the institutional church, especially uh, like neither the Roman nor that's that's not what I'm talking about. So now I tend to look at that as more my word will not return to me void. The message of the Evangelion of the good news of the gospel will accomplish more good in the world than evil. Um, I have faith in that. Um, Again, by which I mean I have both like an intellectual ascent, sure, but I also just, I feel it in my body. I feel this, this joy, this hope, this, this fear because I I see how it's been used to bulldoze the entire rest of the world. I see how it is a cosmology that does still put itself at the center of the universe. It's, there are ways around that, but it requires a lot of mental gymnastics. It's not easy and fun. Uh, I mean, I don't know. It can be fun. I, I, I genuinely think that these kinds of difficult to wrestle with mysteries are themselves part of the point the word for sacraments in greek is mysteria it's it's mysteries uh like and sacramenta the latin word can mean mysteries so like the seven sacraments that the roman catholic church and the eastern orthodox churches talk about are supposed to be a bit challenging and a bit weird and a bit mysterious and a bit, you know, they're supposed to have that juice to them. But I've gotten off on a bit of a tangent. I wanted to talk about, and I guess this is maybe one of the ways, it is both a mystery and a great way to fill in the mystery, the scriptures. I mean, I was kind of talking about them earlier. Both the Masoretic text, the Tanakh, the Septuagint, and the New Testament. And the history of transmission and interpretation behind each of them. Including the historiography. Including the history of 
how our understanding of that history has progressed in different places and different times throughout the world and in, you know, Western society and Christendom. Uh, these are both also part of the embodiment of Jesus in sacrament, in the assembly, wherever two or three are gathered, in the poor, he talks about that in the parable of the steward. Lord, you know, where did I see you hungry and give you food, thirsty and give you drink, naked and clothe you? Where? In the poor. Jesus says, I, that, that I'm in the poor. So that's one of the places where you see him. And in the scriptures. Um, to a certain degree, certainly the history behind the scriptures, I think. But I think it's a little less... Uh, a little more solid even to talk about the scriptures themselves, the words themselves. John talks about Jesus as the word who is God, the word who becomes flesh. And the Christian tradition doesn't actually do a very good job of focusing on the words as we've received them. There may have been Aramaic texts. We lost those. <laughs> Uh, there may have been Aramaic Gospels. There are references to a Gospel to the Hebrews uh, that may have been written in Hebrew, may have been written in Aramaic. We, we've gone. All we have are Greek texts for the New Testament. We have the Septuagint as like kind of the primary Christian use text, but there is like a kind of conversation, uh, especially after Jerome translates the the Masoretic text into the Vulgate. Uh, so that, on the one hand, made Latin, like, you know, helped further spread the use of Latin as the main language of the Old Testament. But it also got Western Christianity re-engaged in actually looking at those words and, you know, treating those words with the same religious reverence that they treated their translations and the Christian scriptures. Uh, and this is barely developed on the, you know, scale of what really should and needs to happen. But Christ is present in the words of scripture and the literal physical words of scripture. And I think that this is something that the tradition says. And this ties back into embodiment because part of what needs to happen there, in my view and my understanding, you didn't used to ever read silently. You would always read out loud reciting whatever scriptures you were reading. So the actual embodied action of making our lips move in Koine Greek or in ancient Hebrew to absorb and study and meditate on and reflect on to proclaim to each other in community to immerse ourselves physically, mentally, spiritually, bodily into the narrative and worldview presented by these two collections of scriptures, these two and a half collections, the, the Tanakh, the Septuagint, and the Christian corpus. Um, letting all of these interact in the Christian, this is part of how Jesus stays embodied. This is part of the Christian tradition. And then this is actually a way to kind of help give solace if you're concerned about the historical Jesus. This idea of Jesus, historical or not, has become enfleshed in these traditions. Jesus is real in all of us in a very, very physical sense, to the point where it almost wouldn't matter whether he had ever physically existed or not. It's almost like his actual physical existence is just icing on the cake. Um, 
and again, maybe that's just me and my own personal biases, hedging my bets and trying to recoup my losses or whatever, but that's where the faith of my body is at today. Like I said, I'm kind of in an exploratory phase, so check in on me in a couple months, I guess, or a couple years. Uh, we'll see how I'm feeling then. But I'm actually somehow managing to run out of storage space, so I gotta cut this short. Short. It's got like an hour and a half of footage, fuck. I could probably keep going for another half hour at least and still not feel like I covered the basics. This probably isn't the end, but it's the end for now.